Hello, this is Stuart Wilde. Welcome to our tape, Creating Miracles in Your Life. In this tape series, you will learn an understanding of the universal law. We will look at the nature of your life's mission, and we will develop an action plan so that you can absolutely materialize those things that you want. Through the laws of attraction, you have the ability to pull to you almost anything that you can visualize and make a part of your feelings. In order to get a good grip of this concept, I would like to read you my book, Miracles. Miracles, Step 1. Understanding the Universal Law. Creating miracles in your life is no more complicated than understanding the metaphysics of the universal law. And because that law is basically indestructible and therefore infinite, we know that the power used by miracle makers in the past is still available today. Yet in our modern society, we're brought up to believe only in those things that we can logically understand. We're not taught either that the universal law has limited potential, or that this power is at our disposal and can be used to work miracles in our own lives. To understand miracles, we have to look at two aspects of the universal law. Firstly, there lies deep within all mankind an immense power. And secondly, the power is impartial and unemotional. Call it the universal mind or Christ consciousness or what you will. It is this power that allows man a recognition of the universal life force that we call God. The life force is eternal. It is a part of all things. Moreover, it is a major part of each of us. Consequently, we all have within us an unlimited power. Creating miracles in our lives becomes a matter of identifying with the power, understanding its characteristics, and learning to use it effectively. This identification is achieved by knowing that the power is within you and acknowledging that fact by saying, I'm eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite, and what I am is beautiful. In this manner, you lock into the power source and you're poised for the next step, which involves looking at its characteristics. The universal law is impartial and unemotional. It has no way of knowing what you want nor does it discriminate between your hopes and aspirations, likes and dislikes. It is pure energy. It accepts whatever thoughts, feelings and actions you project and reflects them back to you unemotionally in the form of events that you experience day to day. In much the same way as electricity illuminates both a brothel and the vicar's tea party, the universal law does not differentiate between different types of energy in your life. It will give you anything you believe in no more and no less. Therefore, the key to understanding miracles is to look at the beliefs you express as thoughts and feelings. When you are born, your thoughts and feelings are limitless because your mind is a clean slate. What a small child projects into the universal law is a natural purity unbounded by the constraints of beliefs. Children often attempt the seemingly impossible. Unaware that they have any physical limitations, they drive off in the family car or walk on a high ledge. It is only later, through education, that they learn the confines of human expectancy. But these confines or boundaries are illusions. They are formed by belief patterns, most of them born of ignorance, handed down from generation to generation. This pool of belief patterns, or collective unconscious as Carl Jung called it, gains validity as it moves through time and eventually the concepts that later generations experience as physical reality become rigid and domineering. It is as if billions of people who preceded you have determined what you are going to experience on the earth plane, and that is all that there is to it. This rigidity does not allow for genius or for the understanding that we are now in an era of rapid unfoldment. Fundamental structures are being swept away in an avalanche of awareness and we are no longer prepared just to read about great miracle makers, we want to have the same experience. For most people this is not possible because they are locked within the limitations of body and mind. Their upbringing is so dominant that it encases their entire evolution and they experience little spiritual growth. Step 2. Understanding Life's Mission We are not our bodies or our emotions or our minds or any of the structures and restrictions we experience around us. We are an infinite part of the God Force, using the physical form to experience spiritual development through a special training called daily life. When you entered the earth plane, the energy that is the real you left its abode in the higher consciousness of pure light 
and entered by choice the body you are now in. You chose the circumstances of this life because it was the next step in your infinite evolution and because this life would allow you to expand what you are spiritually so that you could become an even greater expression of the infinite life force or living spirit. Now you may say, that's nuts. Why would I choose these circumstances of my life, this family, this society, and this neighborhood? Why did I not choose a more affluent environment or a prettier body or more intellectual capacity? The answer lies in a dimension beyond the physical plane. As you entered this dimension through birth, you had within your consciousness a heroic mission, a goal. The nature of that goal is firmly written in the very deepest recesses of the inner you. And what you are today, no matter what you feel about yourself, is actually a part of that goal in its various stages of completion. Your mind began recording events, thoughts, and feelings only at birth. It does not know of your heroic mission, nor does it understand the universal law that interacts with your limitless potential. Why? Two reasons. Firstly, if your mind, feelings, and emotions knew the nature of your heroic goal in life, there would be no challenge or quest and your evolution would suffer. Secondly, most understanding of metaphysics is based on tribal or religious beliefs which do not totally reflect an accurate perception of the delicacy of energy and the way its ebbs and flows affect daily life. No real understanding of the universal law has ever been incorporated into the various belief patterns of the world's collective unconscious. For example, let us say that your heroic goal in life is to learn to love yourself and to accept full cosmic responsibility for what you are. And let us say you have had a number of previous experiences on the earth plane in which you were weak and indulged yourself metaphysically by leaning on others rather than contributing to your own energy or support. If you knew of this in advance, you would begin to favor the one course of action over another. You would intellectualize yourself into positions or feelings that you wanted to achieve, and your mind would dominate your every move. Evolution does not work that way. You cannot overcome weakness by fighting it or thinking your way out of it. You overcome weakness by leaving it behind. This means that you become aware of the inner tendencies that bring you down, that do not support a belief in self, that do not endorse a love of self, and you say, I don't want to be that anymore. Then you move yourself out of the slovenly ways of the collective unconscious into discipline and power. From time to time you may drift back, but once you decide on the side of strength, the power of the universal law will always be with you to varying degrees. It may be a battle at first because your mind does not understand these laws or the nature of your mission on earth, nor does it understand the laws that govern your potential. It will have a tendency to advise you logically from its own experience, and logic is death to that part of you that is a miracle maker. Step 3. Understanding the nature of beliefs. The next step in creating your own miracles is to look at the nature of beliefs. By reviewing beliefs and feelings, you begin to understand how to use the universal law effectively. It is natural to yearn for the impossible, and in so doing, you establish strong beliefs about what can and cannot be done. You can jump a certain height and no higher, run at a certain speed and no faster, accept a certain position and no better. Because most commercial aircraft fly at about 600 miles an hour, the shortest time in which you can get from New York to Paris is about six hours. Those are the facts in the collective unconscious. But what if I told you of a man who could move his body many thousands of miles in just a few seconds? Your mind would scan its memory banks and draw a blank, whereupon you might think impossible. Then perhaps you might review all the scientific data available and conclude that this feat is unachievable. All scientific knowledge and current thinking are products of the same collective unconscious, and just the fact that a billion people have no concept of a man moving 3,000 miles in a few seconds makes it impossible. But the billions of people are wrong. There is a dimension right here on the earth plane in which such a feat is possible. And there are few people alive today who know of this dimension and use it. It is a matter of perception and belief. Your ability to work miracles is predicated entirely on how easily and quickly you can give the collective unconscious the slip. It is your attachment to the collective unconscious or world belief patterns that hold you back. This attachment which you accepted at birth is your main challenge in life and your spiritual goal is to step above it. 
Eventually you realize that in order to become a part of a higher consciousness, you have to leave where you are right now and step into the unknown. That is why all the tales of the path of the initiates talk about loneliness. For as you move away from the old energy, there's a sense of loss. As you take that step, your perceptions expand gradually to accept a higher vibration of self, and you understand what others believe is a part of their evolution, but is not the sum total of all of the facts. We experience life through the five senses, the windows of the soul, and we are taught what capacity those senses have. Yet each of them has a dimension that is many times deeper than is normally perceived, and those dimensions will open for you as you move towards them. Let us look at feelings. Through feelings you can enter into other worlds, and clairsentiousness, a heightened sense of feeling, is a capacity you can learn to develop quite quickly. It is not as acute as extrasensory sight, but it is deep, and through it you can enter into areas of perception that few people ever experience. Everything around you is energy. Your body, its various organs, your thoughts, the physical place you inhabit, the events of your life, each expresses an energy. A part of that energy is perceivable through the five senses, but most of it is beyond normal perception. By opening to the power of the universal law and controlling the mind through centering and discipline, you become aware of the subtlety of energies around you. You will find that you can use your feelings to guide you through life. As you move into a situation, push your feelings into whatever lies ahead. How does it feel? What is the universal law saying to you? Which areas flow and which do not? After a while, this exercise becomes simple and very accurate. You may not be able to see all the subtle energies around you, but you can learn to feel them, and soon you will find the information from the universal law has a way of jumping at you unexpectedly. Events in your life gather energy as they come toward you, and you can feel that energy weeks and even years before they occur. Science will tell you that it's not possible to foresee the future, and that is true for those who believe it's so, but as you move out of the world's group perception, feeling and even seeing the future will become second nature to you. To harness the universal law effectively, you should watch its manifestation, which is basically every event in your life. Then link each event to your underlying feelings and attitude. Realize that when things go well, it is solely because you put that image into the universal law and it responded. Imagine the universal law as a shipping clerk in a large mail order company. He gets your order, but has no idea who you are. If the order says size 8, he sends out size 8. It is of no concern to him whether or not size 8 fits you. He merely complies with your request. In daily life, your feelings, thoughts and attitudes are your order form. So before you decide to change your present conditions, you will have to be very sure what you want from life. The universal law reacts spastically to uncertain messages. You have to write clearly, and you have to be able to accept whatever you're looking for. Let us say you want to win a large sum of money, give up your job and spend the rest of your days laying in the sun. You dream about the cash, and you sigh and you say, wouldn't it be lovely? But is that actually what you want? You might very soon find yourself bored, and though your mind would like to lounge in the sun, the inner you might say, I should have stayed where I was, there was more potential there. Creating energy for yourself, through the universal law, is not just a matter of wishing for things willy-nilly. You have to realize that the power is within you, and once you take the first step towards it, whatever you create will be for your highest good. It might not be exactly what you thought you wanted, but you had better be ready for the consequences. Before embarking on a miracle action plan, you ought to spend some time meditating on the conditions or material objects you want. The universal law is the shipping clerk waiting for your clear and concise order. The currency with which you are going to pay for it is belief. To create something with absolute certainty, you have to establish the feeling within you that it has already happened, that the condition you desire is already a part of your life. That can be hard because your mind, knowing nothing about the workings of the law, fights back. You affirm, I am rich, and your mind contradicts, you're not. The conflict that developed confuses the universal law, which is about to deliver your heart's desire. This clash of opposing energies has been the challenge of the would-be initiate since the beginning of time. It is the hunt for the Holy Grail, or the slaying of the dragon. It states that no one enters the kingdom of heaven within until he has tamed the dragon of negativity that he inherited from the collective unconscious. Figuratively, 
you will have to leave the earth plane even though you may be still very much a part of physical reality. Dimensions are not out there someplace between you and the stars. They are inner worlds or inner journeys. These journeys have an inner reality and an outer manifestation in the physical. So anything you can conceive is actually a part of you right now. The fact that you do not have it to hand matters not. Whatever it is that you conceive is in a state of gradual becoming. If you affirm, I am rich, you have to start feeling rich, thinking rich, and holding a rich attitude. Walk around expensive stores, have coffee in the best hotel in town, begin to act and feel as if you already have the vast fortune you know the universal law is about to deliver to you. This way you create a concrete reality of wealth within your inner journey, and it will then become manifest in your outer journey, the physical world. If you can maintain that feeling and power and live as if your wish has already been granted by the universal law, your wish will be delivered, guaranteed. But you cannot be half-hearted or you will dissipate your personal power and nothing will happen. You'll have to take the path like a warrior. You're going to achieve your goal, no matter what confronts you, no matter where you are right now, no matter what adversity faces you, you will reach your objective. The universal law does not care whether you have your heart's desire or not. Therefore, you might as well make up your mind to collect. You can have anything you want, and when you create it, it becomes yours. Often we feel we do not deserve success, or wealth, or complete health, or anything else we might yearn for. We are taught in childhood that we are not worthy, or that somehow we owe something to society, or the physical plane, or that we have some kind of special sin that we should atone for before we can enjoy what we want out of life. That is not the case. The law does not discriminate. It receives your energy and delivers diamonds or plain rocks, depending on what you put in. It is very important to look at the negative feelings you have about yourself. It is easy to say, Oh, I never win anything. Or, I'm too old, they will never hire me. Or, I can never be with that person, I'm not pretty enough. That kind of thinking is indicative of the mind and its logical advice. Miracles are not logical, so the last thing you need is logical advice from the mind. When such advice is given, acknowledge the mind, thank it, and say, I do not accept any energy that is contrary to the unlimited power that lies within me. Then press on. Infinite power is so magnanimous, so powerful, so much more than the mind, that it exists in a separate dimension, and that is why the mind has difficulty perceiving that it is even there. You will get an intuition or feeling, or a rush of excitement, but that is all. You cannot really hear it, touch it, or taste it, but it comes around the mind like a breeze, and when it starts to work in your life, you will know it by the quality of the people and the events that surround you. Before we go to step four, the miracle action plan, let us briefly review some important points. The universal law, or living spirit, is unlimited. Therefore, what you are is unlimited. The universal law is impartial and unemotional. It cannot discriminate. It will give you anything you believe in. You are not your body or your emotions or your mind. You are a part of the living spirit learning. No matter what your circumstances, the universal law can be called upon at any time because it is the real you. Whatever you create for yourself by understanding the mystical, metaphysical aspects of the universal law is yours because you created it. You deserve it. Miracles are not gifts from God. They are a part of you, which is God. Finally, the universal law is in balance and harmony by its very nature. And so, as you set out on your action plan, you will not be able to infringe on others. Whatever you create will have to be for yourself. You cannot will the universal law onto others by saying, I want this to happen to my friend. This would be infringing, because not knowing the nature of your friend's heroic life plan, you are not entitled to change it or in any way alter what he is going through at this time. He has to experience life for himself, as he also has unlimited power within him, and a part of his growth pattern is discovering that fact. Within the universal law, there is no dual energy, good and bad, saints and sinners. There is just energy, one power that pervades all things, and everything is a part of that power. Differentiation between good and evil is just your perception, for within real energy there is no judgment. There is high energy and not so high energy, 
and at the end of this life you will have the opportunity to review what you have achieved, which will be a matter of how much you have succeeded in centering your life in a discipline of perceiving the living spirit and using it. But your review will not be emotional. You will be looking at the quality, or speed if you like, of the energy you created. If you have harmed others, you have impeded your evolution by deaccelerating the life force within you. That is your karmic energy, and someday you will have to understand that it was not your highest path. But you cannot judge others, because since the energy your mind perceives does not incorporate the nature of their heroic goal, you have no way of knowing exactly what they need karmically for their growth at this infinite point in their evolution. There are no accidents or victims. Each person is responsible for his own evolution. Each pulls to himself the circumstances experienced in life. He puts in an order, so to speak, and gets back three cracked cups. That is a part of the learning pattern, trial and error. This lifetime is yours. You may be involved in relationships and loved ones, but basically what you make of your life and how you pass through it is your evolution. We all learn to take responsibility for our own circumstances, and within the universal law you are not expected to take responsibility for the evolution of others. It might sound a bit harsh, but in the law there is an incredible clarity and justice. That is why adversity is so useful. It allows people to look for something beyond day-to-day -day reality, and this brings them in touch with their true inner selves. In desperation they begin to pull on their unlimited power, and they realize that anything can be changed, that suffering is a product of the inner self, and by looking at their inner selves they can transform them. It has been said that there are no incurable diseases, only incurable people, and that is true of all energy within the universal law. Trying to fix your circumstances just physically or mentally will not work in the long run, because deep-rooted inconsistencies will continue to surface in your life in various disguises. To overcome something once and for all means going within yourself to discover the real cause of the disturbance. This process or discovery will allow you more energy which you can use to create the things you want in life. Step 4. The Miracle Action Plan Write down on a piece of paper in order of importance the things and the conditions you want. Do not let the mind advise you. It has limitations. Shoot for the moon and be sure you leave nothing out. Chop and change your list until you are comfortable with it, but be clear about what you want. Use exact and precise wording to describe the conditions you require. Remember, the system works, so you must be definite in the way you describe your wants. Here's what to do. A. Read the list three times a day. Once when you rise, once in the middle of the day, and once before bed. B. Meditate on your miracles from time to time, and know that the universal law has received your order and is just about to deliver. C. Maintain silence. Talking about your miracle dissipates the energy drastically. Therefore, you cannot share your miracle with others until they happen. D. Always act and think about your miracles as though you already have the conditions you desire. E. Be open to the inner promptings of the unlimited power source as it instructs you in ways of getting what you want. Realize that universal law has to deliver in the physical plane where you can make use of it. Your heart's desire can come from anywhere, so do not limit your field of expectation. Remain open and flexible at all times. F. Smile a lot. The first miracle is on its way. Step 5. Understanding Energy Since the mind has no way of knowing how the universal law is going to deliver your miracle, do not waste your time trying to figure out just know. Your thoughts should be like acorns that develop gradually into oaks. If you dig them up to discover how things are going, your tree will perish. It is important to avoid fretting. Center on the feeling that some way, somehow, the universal law will not let you down because everything in the universe is energy. Solid objects appear as such only because their atoms and molecules move at the speed of light. In fact, reality is both solid and not solid at the same time and this applies to thought forms. They are real and even more powerful than physical reality because they are not constrained by the limits of the material plane. You cannot take them apart and analyze them. You have to create them and let them fly. Through your enthusiasm and belief you energize the universal law and encourage it to deliver. Try at all times to keep your thoughts pure and on target. If doubt creeps in, do not allow it to dominate for long. 
Look at doubt from above yourself. Realize that it is just the mind fretting, not understanding, creating objections through ignorance, and whatever you have set in motion will happen. As you work with the power, it will have a way of showing you the next move at every turn. Believe in it. Know that this inner force is so powerful that it will pull you into excitement and adventure beyond your dreams. Keep it pure, remain silent, and remember to keep your methods secret. Everything that surrounds you has the living spirit within it in varying degrees. Living things express it more than do inanimate objects, but all have it. The more you come in touch with the universal law within you, the more you're in touch with the things around you. Everything becomes a symbol and strength to you. The world helps you, and the fuller you become, the more dimensions you can pull from. A very dear friend was walking along a street one day, wondering what to do with her life. She was at the crossroads literally and figuratively. Life was flat. She craved inspiration and asked the universal law to direct her. As she stepped from the curb, a passing car nearly knocked her over, and as it screeched round the corner, a book fell out of the trunk. It was a book about man's quest for the universal power, and it changed her life. Shortly, she left the town and embarked on a whole new evolutionary path that over a period of time has taken her to great metaphysical heights and into countries and relationships she could not have conceived of before. The universal law provided her with a special teaching in the form of that book, and she, being in tune, was ready to benefit. And so it should be for you. As you work towards your miracle, watch for every sign, for every change around you, and you will see the universal law communicating with you. The more you trust it, the more the energy is encouraged to reveal itself, and various unusual things begin to occur, your energy quickens and opportunities pop up like corks on a lake then you will know that the power is truly with you. This coming in tune more than anything else will help you manifest your desires. You cannot act negatively in one part of the universal law and expect the other part to deliver your miracles unaffected. As you watch your life, you become expert at reading symbols and you see that you are the only one responsible for what you are and that everything around you expresses an energy. The clothes you wear, the things you say, the people you associate with, the food you eat, the places you go are all statements to the universal law of what you are. The quality of these statements, or the coming in tune with yourself and your surroundings, is the key to your spiritual unfoldment. What you are has great power. Its energy oscillates and reflects the amount of living spirit or God force that you express. The more you work on your life, the more you accept responsibility, the more energy you will have and the greater will be your expectations. Suppose you have a special project in mind and you want to be sure that you have the maximum possible energy available. Let us say you're heading for a job interview. You've put that job on your miracle list and the universal law has opened a door and you're halfway there. Here is what to do. 1. Continue to see your miracle coming into physical reality. See yourself with the job granted until 72 hours before the interview. Then forget it. 2. On the day of the interview, rise early. Spend as much time as possible on your own. Avoid interpersonal conflicts. Tell the universal law that you are ready and willing to accept the miracle you have been asking for. 3. Abstain from such energy-lowering substances as alcohol and drugs. 4. Eat lightly. The universal law manifests in you and through you. If you eat great amounts of heavy food, your energy slows and the universal law within you has difficulty expressing itself. You should have salads, fruit, natural healthy food in sparing quantities. Stay away from junk food. 5. Before you set off for your interview, relax a moment. See the situation as flowing and positive. If you already know the person you will be meeting, see him or her in your mind's eye, happy and smiling, receptive to your energy. See the interview going well. See the miracle delivered. Step 6. Understanding time. Within the universal law, there is no time. Things are in a state of gradual evolvement. A tree has no concept of time because its essence is eternal. 
It responds to the warmth of the sun, but it is not in time. It develops from seed, expanding gradually to full maturity, and so it is with the universal law. It can deliver instantly, but if your energy is not all there, it will seem to you as if it has taken time. You have to learn patience and keep moving towards your goal, knowing that your thought forms will manifest. If you are moving towards one particular miracle and a different avenue opens up unexpectedly, take it. The universal law delivers in strange ways, and what you think you desire may just be your way of expressing a totally different goal. A good friend of mine wanted more than anything else to be a film director. He graduated from film school in London, but found that he could not get any work because of a technical complication. To work in films in England at that time, you had to have a union card, but you could not get a union card unless you were working. In effect, the union created a closed shop. My friend's miracle was stuck. One day, out of the blue, he bumped into an old school friend who owned a restaurant, and because of his financial straits, he gladly accepted a job as a waiter. Working hard each day, he spent his spare time watching films and keeping his dreams alive through study. Each day at noon, a well-dressed old man came into the restaurant. My friend served him diligently, and over the months, the two of them became friends. One day, my friend asked the old man what he did for a living. The old man replied that he was just about to retire from a job that he'd held for many years. What job is that? Asked my friend. Oh, it's pretty boring, really. Replied the old man. I'm president of the filmmakers' union. Not much ever happens. Fifteen years later, I was flying across the United States, lazily watching an in-flight movie, when, to my great delight, I saw my friend's name on the credit of a major film. His miracle had been delivered. When you move into an energy alignment, you can never tell what will happen. Watch for signs. Use your feelings to help you decide. And if, after that, you're still not sure, do nothing. If a direction is right, you will know it automatically. If, however, making up your mind requires you to go through great trials and tribulations, you can be sure that that particular course is not the one for you. Basically, it is well to remember: if you have to ponder a decision, it is usually a mistake. When the universal law delivers, you will know. Start your miracle list with a couple of modest requests. Then, as you experience the universal law delivering, you will feel the power of success around you, and that in itself becomes a valuable affirmation. Each time you reorganize your list, spend a few moments thinking about how well your last miracles worked. Affirm your power by visualizing your success. Then, as you accomplish one miracle after another, you will have the confidence to go on to other things. Step seven: Understanding your personal power. In conclusion, we will discuss how to establish an energy of power around you. Your mind's natural negative alignment will tend to make you think that your miracles are not going to come true. Therefore, in order to achieve complete success, you have to work constantly on your mind's doubt. Remind yourself that you're not your mind, and you do not accept an energy contrary to your goals. In this way, you establish a pattern of positive affirmation in your life. Write down in your own words nine affirmations that express your belief in yourself and your complete fulfillment in this lifetime. Three affirmations for the dawn, three for the day, and three for the night. Before reviewing your miracle list, relax, center your mind, then read your affirmations slowly. Make your affirmations strong. Be sure that you feel their power and that they mean something special to you. The words and feelings that you believe in. Have the strongest energy. Here are a few examples from which you can build. I am a powerful, positive individual, and all events in this day are for my highest good. What I am is beautiful, and I pull to me this day only beauty and refreshment. This day is a day of balance. I am completely aware of my body and all its needs. What I am is eternal, immortal, universal, and infinite. I see only beauty and strength every moment of my life. I see only beauty in all the people who are pulled to me, and what I am strengthens and refreshes what they are. What I am is infinite. I do not judge the evolution of others. What they are right now is for their highest good. Each action I take this day is an expression of the God Force. Therefore, each action I take is a part of my infinite creativity. There is no real sin. Only energy. I follow the energy of my highest evolution at all times, 
and so be it. I am open at all times to communication from my inner self, and that communication leads me to my highest evolution. I give thanks for the beauty of this day, and may the energy of this night bring rebuilding and review. So be it. Your affirmation act like small twigs in a fire. As you rise, you begin to build energy in the day. Use your affirmations to keep that energy going. Center for a moment to acknowledge your infinite beauty and your place in all things. Then proceed. If you are pulled into interpersonal conflict, take a few minutes on your own to repair your energy. And, before going out in the day, be sure that your energy is strong. If you care for your power and your balance and you center your life, no harm can befall you and you enter into worlds that few people are even aware of. Create your day the way you want it. See it going well. See each person you meet as positive and open to your energy. See the day as harmonious and flowing and see yourself evolving through each and every experience. Finally, before setting out in the day, see the white light of the living spirit around you, protecting you and strengthening what you are. Realize the more you believe in yourself, the stronger the white light becomes. It acts as your shield and from time to time each day, you should re-energize it by seeing it vibrant and strong and by affirming that what you are is a part of the living spirit or God and that each moment of your life is one of exhilaration and learning. Your position on the earth plane as a miracle maker is inherent in the infinite power that lies within you. That limitless source lies there waiting for you to step up and collect your heritage. And when you do, the power will always be with you. And that is guaranteed. So be it. As we listen to my book, Miracles, there are probably a number of concepts contained in the book that you may not be familiar with or that perhaps is different to some of the religious or philosophical beliefs that you may hold. And I can understand that. And of course, my belief is that each person should seek out from the information around them those concepts, those ideals, morals and values that suit them. You're an individual and you have to develop your own philosophy of life from within the context of living life. And using that philosophy and that morality, you will develop within yourself a powerhouse of strength because it will be yours. You won't be living a second-hand philosophy or a handed-down philosophy from somebody else. You'll be creating a philosophy that's strong and powerful, a philosophy that nurtures you, a philosophy that is designed with you at the center, with you at heart. As you begin to concentrate upon yourself and as you begin to see your life in dedication, then of course energy grows and it grows very, very quickly. You'll have the impression that things are only moving along slowly and sometimes perhaps you may even find yourself being a little bit impatient with yourself, striving and yearning for more and yet somehow not necessarily seeing all the results that you want all at once. However, you have to remember that the inner power that you have is a hidden energy. It does not manifest itself necessarily in events around you. However, as that power exudes, it is like a light that goes out and bit by bit everything begins to shine more brightly. At first, the change isn't really noticeable because the power that you've exuded over your affairs and your life, the energy that you've placed into your home and your job and the people that you love and the people that surround you, it has a pattern. For that pattern to change, it takes time. It takes time for the light to go inside that pattern of your life to enliven it. And usually you'll find that it'll take a number of months before the changes begin to occur. And then it'll take a number of years before all of those changes in your life are consolidated. You have a heritage or a goal in your life to become free, to become an absolutely powerful individual that is not dependent upon the rest of the world, that is not emotionally sucked into the world. You have a heritage to get to that peak. Most people never make it. And the reason they don't make it is because they are reluctant to move away from the old lifestyles. It's almost as if they live in a prison, the gate is always open, there are no guards, and yet somehow they've got so friendly with the prisoners and the regimen of living in this prison that they can't walk out of the gate. We're living in a world today where there is a very, very desperate need for enlightened beings people that have a higher consciousness, people that can expound a new philosophy, a new light. You heard in the book me talking about the golden age, and that has been an archetypal symbol in the mind of man since 
the beginning of time. It's a belief that at some point, eventually, man will transcend his inadequacies and we will reach a world of absolute peace, absolute power, a world where all the people are nurtured, a world without prejudice, without evil, without restriction. But as a metaphysician and as a, an evolving person, you have to understand that a thousand years in the history of our planet is just a bat of the cosmic eyelid. It isn't any time at all. And so often as you look at, let's say, for example, the peace movements in the world, the hunger movements, the movements for social justice, the movements for full employment or whatever, you can see how everybody is yearning and rushing and pushing and trying to make it happen overnight. If you put that same kind of negative yearning into whatever cause you feel strongly about, what you're basically saying is the world is not okay. For you to have a transcendent lifestyle, a lifestyle of true power, where everything flows to you naturally, you have to see the world as beautiful. Inside the mayhem, there is all sorts of growth experiences. Inside the difficulty, the famine, the wars, there is man struggling through his inadequacies to discover himself. When you can understand that and detach a little bit, you can allow this whole process to take time. Can you imagine, if the God Force wanted to change the world, do you think it would be a problem? Do you think it would be a problem to infuse the minds of man with a peaceful energy so everybody became peaceful, or to infuse in the minds of man a greater sense of sharing so that all the people of the planet would have enough abundance? I'm sure that the God Force could do that if it wished, and yet it cannot infringe upon us any more than we should not infringe upon the people around us. It has to allow everybody to come up gradually and to understand those perceptions gradually. As you become more powerful and a stronger person, people are going to come around you. Your family members are going to want to know, hey, how come you're living a little bit of a different lifestyle? Or how come you've changed? Or how come you're looking smarter and your clothes look better and you're more groomed and it seems like you have more money and more travel and more fluidity? And they are going to come to you. When they come to you, you can act as a teacher. You can inspire. You can show them the positivity and the strength that is there in life. However, what happens to some people is they gain a modicum of power and then they want to go out and change the world. When you want to go out and change the world, what you're saying is the world isn't okay. And you have to accept it as beautiful. You have to accept that it is divinely perfect. Even though to our finite minds, as we are in this energy pattern, battling through the inconsistencies, sometimes it seems to us like it's not okay. Hey, wait a minute, I feel pain, I feel discomfort, I feel frustration. Where's the employment? Where's the money? Where's the world peace? But in fact, when you look at it as an overview, if you could leave the planet and go up about two or three hundred miles and look back at it, you can see that there is a gradual sense of improvement. You can look back to the 60s and see that, for example, the energy today in the 80s and as we move on into the 90s is much more powerful than it was in the 60s. And the 60s were more powerful than the 40s. And the 40s was a whole different era than the turn of the century. And so you can see that man is coming very, very quickly. I mean, almost like a train through the night in his evolution, but it will take time. And as you develop this power, your main function is to express it with this unconditional love to people, not imposing your opinion upon people, but just waiting for them to come along and ask you. If a person comes and asks you for information or for advice, give it to them as fairly and as equitably as you can. But don't go out and seek people to fix. Don't go out into the society and say, I've got to fix this. This is terrible. I've got to fix it. You don't have to fix it. It is what it is, and it's coming up as time goes on. If we look through the Miracles book, we can see that in it there are one or two unusual concepts or concepts that do not follow the average philosophy or the more usual religious philosophies. And I wanted to take a moment at this time to just extrapolate from the book and from those concepts and expand on them and to give you a greater awareness for your consideration. And then you can incorporate those concepts into your life if they feel comfortable for you, if they nurture you, or not include them as you wish.
The first thing that you probably will have noticed from listening to miracles is that there is an utter simplicity to it. The process isn't complicated. As human beings, we tend to think that things have to be difficult, that things have to have a modicum of struggle, that getting money has to take effort, that being in love has to mean that somehow we lose a part of ourselves or whatever it may be. In fact, when you look at nature and you look at life and you look at energy in motion, it is utter simplicity. Think of the clarity and the simplicity of a lightning bolt. It isn't complicated. It's just this pure flash of light. And in the same way, as you begin to create miracles in your life, be careful that you don't complicate the issue. Isn't it true that sometimes we'll head off on a project and we'll make it immensely difficult and immensely complicated when all we had to do actually was walk across the street? When you relax and you allow that freshness and that simplicity and that humbleness to come into your life, things appear automatically. Where it says in the Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth, meek did not mean wimpy or weak or people that you could punch up. It, it's basically a sense of simplicity, of naturalness, of an alignment to nature, an understanding that everything is perfect and that everything will flow to you. And as you come out of the intellect and more into this magnanimous feeling of limitless inside of you, the simplicity begins to develop and everything has a natural beauty. The next concept that I wanted to discuss was the concept of God as energy rather than as a personality. God as energy has been the cornerstone of all the mystical metaphysical teachings through all time. And it was an understanding that in fact God is light. And that light is love, it's expansiveness, it's going beyond, it's outward seeking, it is nurturing and caring. In the old tribal days, you could imagine these tribal people with a very limited education, with sort of very low IQs, with very low life expectancy, living in difficult circumstances in the desert in North Africa or a tribal person living in Central Australia. They didn't have an understanding of complex energy patterns. Psychology only began in the 1900s. Words that we take for granted like ego and perception persona and dream interpretation and psychoanalysis are all very modern concepts. In the olden days, tribal man did not go into his mind to seek out the complexity of the psyche, the complexity of the subconscious mind. And so you had a tribal system where there was no electricity, there was no modern appliances. They just lived on the land with their animals, with their loved ones and tribal members around them. And so they had tribal leaders and tribal princes. Dukes owned various chunks of the territory. There were warlords and shoguns. And so it was natural for them to express a higher power or a divinity in a personality. I think one of the things that I found most interesting as I studied history and I studied the philosophies of nations as they developed was that most gods are male. In almost all of the traditions, they're male. And the reason that they are male is that the hierarchies of the tribes, the princes and the priests and the leaders of those tribes were also male. There wasn't a conception of powerful goddess female. There has been that goddess energy naturally throughout the whole of history. But generally speaking, if you look at the major religions and the major philosophies of the world, God is always a male figure. And the reason that is so is because the tribal leaders and the warlords and the people that ran the tribes were considered the most powerful energy within that tribe. And they were masculine because they lived in a very earthy time. They had to be warriors to survive. They had to scratch a living from the earth with no tools, no electricity, no equipment to do it with. And so it was very important to be strong. And if you weren't strong, you died. In biblical times, life expectancy was only 20 to 30 years. I mean, if you were a 30 year old male, you were old. I mean, really old and wise. And so as you look at this tribal system from which we have come and which is so much a part of our inner feelings and you can see that we've inherited the masculine God idea from those early days. If you are in a religion or a philosophy that has one of these masculine God figures of the top of the philosophy or as a divine entity in the philosophy, then what you need to do is to somehow take the image of that masculine figure and bring it into yourself. As you try to expand power, it is almost impossible to do so if you see God outside of yourself. 
And the reason why it is so difficult to do that, if you do see God outside of yourself, is that what you're saying is, I do not control my life. Some entity above me or beyond me is controlling my life. And of course, that is the case for the vast majority of the population. But as you become a more powerful person, if you can internalize that male God figure inside of you and understand that that energy is exuding, then you can hold on to the philosophy and it doesn't affect the quality of your religious belief. In fact, the quality of that belief is enhanced because you get in greater touch with what that image is, but also you internalize the energy and you have it in your life. And I think that's extremely important. You see, in those days, in the olden days, it was very hard. I mean, it was impossible, in fact, for a tribal member to understand God as light because they weren't part of energy. Today, we understand it. We understand what's in a light socket. If somebody talks to us about a laser disc, we may not necessarily know what a laser disc is in its intimate details, but we have an idea. We know what a laser beam of light might be. And so we're in infinitely more sophisticated. If you met some of the characters out of the biblical times, you'd be amazed at how thick they were, you know? You wouldn't hang out with them for five minutes because you, inside you, have all of the energy of 2,000 years that has come on since. And so you have the sophistication of a society that's moving so many thousands of times faster than it was in the olden days. And so for you to develop that same kind of sophistication, I want you to consider internalizing your God figure or your divine entity, whatever that may be, and realize that that figure is inside of you rather than outside of you. And I think that's a comfortable way of converting yourself from one of the more older traditional philosophies into a philosophy of self-empowerment. And that, of course, is my main interest. I don't have an interest in changing your religion or changing your philosophy. I only have an interest in seeing that you become a more powerful being. The next concept that I think is important is that you'll notice in the book very early on, I talk about the God force or God being impartial. And that to most people is a very unusual concept because we have been taught that God had emotion. If, say, for example, you go into the Bible, you can read all sorts of stories about God being angry with these people and God being pleased over here and God telling people this, and there was a lot of emotion. If you've been to the Middle East and if you've been to the Holy Lands, you know that the people that live there are extremely emotional people, and they have a sense of exaggeration about the way they describe things. When two people have a fight in an Arab country. It may be only a fight about a car parking space outside the local cinema, but the way they talk to each other is in vastly exaggerated terms. I mean, they threaten all sorts of mutilation and mayhem to each other over one little parking space. When they're in love, they do the same thing. They talk about the moon and the stars and the light of the person's eyes and their incredible beauty, and it's just a way of talking. And as you look at that, you can see how we inherited in modern times the idea of an emotional God. In fact, that isn't correct. The life force that permeates all things, the God force that permeates all things, is an energy that has your evolution at heart and loves you because you are it and it is you. But it is not intimately involved in whether you're happy or not happy or whether you had cornflakes for breakfast or didn't. And so when you pull out of that emotional relationship, then you win back part of your own power. I've been involved over about 10 to 12 years in research in altered states of consciousness. And I've been through the whole gamut of what is open to people in that area, including trance states and out-of-body experiences, ESP, psychokinesis, and a thousand and one things that go bump in the night. And one of the things that I found was that I had the ability to entrance my mind and to achieve very, very low levels of brainwave activity and still remain awake. A normal person or a person that hasn't trained in brainwave techniques or in altered states of consciousness, as their brainwaves slow down, they automatically cross the threshold into sleep. And the training basically that I was involved in was a training of learning to stay awake when the brain is basically dormant. As I got involved in that, I began to see symbols and I trained in understanding how symbols express themselves in those inner worlds. And one day, when I was in a meditation, in a trance, I saw this tube 
and it's the same tube that people who've had near-death experiences describe. And it's a tube that seems to lead to other worlds. If you're familiar with those near-death books, basically what happens is somebody has a terrible accident and they get them to hospital and they basically die. And in that death process, they come out of their bodies and usually they go up this tube or this tunnel and at the end of the other tunnel is some kind of celestial kingdom and often they're met by some kind of spiritual entity or Jesus or whatever their symbol is and then because their body recovers on the operating table they get twanged back into their body usually the spirit entity says not yet and then bang they're back and the surgeon's pumping adrenaline into their heart well one of the things was that when I was in these altered states of consciousness I saw this tube and eventually over a period of years I had the ability to move up through this tube and to direct my consciousness to the other end of the tube and to enter into the celestial worlds. One of the first things that I discovered there was the nature of this God force or this light. And so when I talk to you about the God force, I'm talking to you from my own experience, subjective as it might be. It's an experience that I've actually had. And the light is more magnanimous, more loving, more expansive than there are real words to describe. But the first thing that I did notice was that that light or that energy didn't have a a lot of stuff or opinion about who I was. Unconditional love is the total acceptance of another being. And the way that the God force relates to you is to totally accept you. If the God force was emotionally involved in your life, then that would not be total acceptance. And so that was one of the realizations that I had in these experiments. And I've talked to other people who've had the same experience and each and all of them confirm the same characteristics of the impartiality. And the impartiality does not come from not caring. It is not like the life force or the God force doesn't care about you. It's more like it loves you so much that it will allow you the time and the patience to become what it is you want to be. As you look at the book, you can see that I talk about how the world is energy and that your body is energy and everything that you are is energy. If you can begin to identify with that infinite self inside of you rather than your body or the physical things around you, you very, very quickly link in or go back into that infinity inside of you. And I think that's important because the way to create a miracle is to understand that it will have to move through energy to get to you. If you see the world as very solid and factual and intellectual and logical, then there isn't any logical explanation as to how you may be healed overnight or any logical explanation as to how you may receive a vast sum of money tomorrow without effort. But when you look at it as energy and you understand the laws of attraction, you are basically pulling to you the results that you need through a dimension that is not solid. If you see your body is solid, I see the circumstances around you as solid, it somewhat limits your ability to believe in it happening. And so I felt it was an important point to begin to establish this idea of you are consciousness. You can create through the power of your thought. If your life force and your strength is strong, you can more or less materialize things instantaneously. If it is not so strong, it'll take time. But you're thinking in terms of something coming towards you in a sea of energy rather than through the fragmented a more obscure logical process where often there isn't a logical explanation as to how things actually work. Part, I think, of your energy as you begin to develop into this miracle maker is that you should consider detaching somewhat from the social 
ethnic tribal energy that we all come from. We were all born somewhere, we were all born a part of one tribe or another. The tribe may now have expanded to 50 million people, but it's still a tribe, it's a mindset, it's a socio-economic unit. And as you pull out of that a little bit, it allows you the freedom to oscillate faster, to vibrate faster. If you're very sucked into the old tribal ways, then what happens is you take on the identity of the tribe rather than an identity of yourself. So let's say, for example, you're Irish. You can love Ireland and you can read the Irish poets and you can recall the times that you had in, in Limerick and Tipperary or wherever it is that you came from. But within your Irishness, you have to bring that back inside of yourself and say, I am an individual. The fact that I was born in Ireland was a factor of my evolution. But first, I'm an individual. Secondly, I'm an Irishman. And as you begin to detach one pace or one step away from the tribal energy, then again you begin to win back your power. You begin to win back that power that will create the miracles for you. Throughout the whole of time and throughout the history of man's struggle within himself, there have been initiates, there have been great beings that have managed to go beyond the limitations of the earth plane. And the way they did it was they won the battle of the mind. There's a part of you that will hold on to the negativity, the fragmented, the ego, the belief in limitation and is a part of you that is expansive and loving and joyous and heading out and those two parts will always be in contention with each other at the beginning perhaps the negative part or the personality part may be much much stronger than the infinite positive expansive part of you and the name of the game is to begin to overwhelm the negativity with positivity you've heard me talk perhaps in the past about being careful with your vocabulary being careful with the way that you present yourself if you're going to come out of positivity you have to come out of it all of the time you have to establish that energy inside of you an energy of hope one of transcendence one of serving humanity without infringing upon them and then as you begin to do that the inner mind that it retains so much of that negativity that darkness it begins to back away but you have to remember that you've been on the earth plane a certain amount of years and that inner mind is not going to let go just because you say oi get out of here it has dominated the inner mind the negativity of the inner mind it has control of your life or it has had control of your life often it'll make you sick it'll make your body sick just to control you it'll cause difficulty just to be able to feel that it is in control as you begin to become more infinite, the ego or the dark part of the mind begins to back off and you may have a feeling that you're dying. And of course that is a natural feeling on the path and it isn't your physical death that you're looking at. What you're looking at is that the personality is giving ground to the infinity. And so the personality will have a feeling of it's losing importance or dying. As you push out as a miracle maker and as you begin to get this action plan going, you have to establish in your feelings the idea that one, you are worthy, two, you can receive. So often in our society we put an emphasis on giving, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. But you have to understand for every giver there has to be a receiver. When you feel comfortable in receiving, when a person offers you something, take it. It doesn't matter whether they offer you a polyester lame shirt with a nude on the front that sort of moves when you move. You take it. You say thank you and you take it. And it doesn't matter if you don't want it. Because sure enough, if it becomes a part of your possessions in that kind of energy, then somebody will come along to you and they'll say, listen, I'm going to the party and I need a polyester shirt with a nude on the front that moves when I move. And you'll say, well, I've just got the perfect one. Begin to practice accepting. When you see money in the street, pick it up. Even if it's only a penny or a cent or whatever, pick that thing up. When somebody offers you something, take it. When they offer to help you, accept it. When they offer to heal you, let them heal you. When they offer to give you money, accept their money. And as you begin to open to receiving, then that energy can come to you. Look at nature. It doesn't have a problem receiving. 
The animals don't sit there and think, gosh, I better give rather than receiving. They're flowing naturally and simply through the forest and they receive. And they receive nurturement for one kind or another, food and water and whatever they need to survive. And so I want you to center upon that. I want you to center on being a person that is ready to receive. And once you are comfortable with receiving, then the quality of your giving is enhanced because you're bigger. You're a wider, more expansive person. So often you'll get people that center upon giving and they give little bits and always with considerations and limitations and conditions. Imagine when you get to the point when you can just give freely. You're radiating the sunshine from your heart. And that can only come if you have trained yourself to receive. And so I want you to watch as you go through next week and the week after. I want you to watch how well you receive. Are you an expert in receiving? Have you graduated from the university of receiving? Because interestingly enough, that is the key to being able to become expansive. You may remember in the book I said that you are on your own. And that's true. The divinity inside of you comes to the physical plane for your evolution. If you concentrate on that power inside of you, the miracle maker, this limitless energy, then what happens is you become stronger. All of the philosophies and most of the major religions teach that we're not supposed to concentrate upon ourselves. We're supposed to concentrate on, first of all, a God outside of ourselves, and secondarily, on people in the society that we're supposed to assist or aid in some way. The philosophy that I teach is one where you turn and you face yourself, understanding that if you become strong, then you have a gift that you can take to society. So many people I meet as I travel and do seminars in the Pacific and all over the world, they want to serve humanity, they want to give, and yet they don't really have any true power with which to give. They want to assist the world to go beyond poverty, but they don't have any money themselves. They want to heal the world, but their body's sick. And so as you're looking at that, you understand that you're on your own. The fact that you may be with a wife or a husband and have children and loved ones and business associates and a associations of one kind, all of that is to reflect you back to yourself. That is his function, and that's the function of interpersonal relationships. They are there so you learn about yourself. And in fact, you are an individual evolving through the physical plane, and that individuality is sacrosanct, and you have to make it important. And I don't mean it in the ego sense of the word, but you remember that you are on your own. You come in as an individual, and you go out as an individual. You'll remember in the book also I said that universal law has no way of knowing what it is you want. That sometimes is confusing for people because they think in terms of God being all-knowing. And the way that I would like to explain it to you for your consideration is this. Whereas the God force or the life force is in all things, which is true, it does not have a concentration minute by minute on each individual part. It would be the same as if you owned or were president of a huge multinational corporation. You may know that you have a branch in Nigeria, but you don't know at 9 a.m. on Tuesday whether the secretary is off sick or not, or whether the electricity has blown a fuse and the telex isn't working, or whatever it may be. You're not intimately, emotionally involved in the day-by-day, hour-by-hour events in your office in Nigeria. All you're interested in is the information that flows into your head office, and that's how you're controlling the situation, or that is how you're allowing this corporation to evolve. The life force, being in all things, not having an opinion, being impartial, is not involved in knowing what you want or having a decision. It is not as if God says, for you to be rich is good, for you to be poor is bad. God doesn't say, we want you to be healthy. And it doesn't say, it's bad to be sick. It doesn't have an opinion. And if you think about it, that idea sets you free. Because once it doesn't have an opinion, it can reflect back to you exactly what you are with an uninterrupted and totally pure reflection. You don't want a reflection coming back to you that has somebody's opinion in it because you'd be heading off to the beach and the opinion might say, go to the concert, if you know what I mean. And so when you understand that, you have to be very clear about what it is you want and what you put into the universal law. As you look at your miracle action plan, you can't be wishy-washy. If you just put in an affirmation that says, I want more money, what does that mean? If you walk over 10 cents in the street, you've got more money. 
So that's it. That's the energy of that idea gone. So you're looking at being specific and yet leaving it open enough so that it can come from anywhere. So you would say, I would like to increase my abundance tenfold in the next six months. You're giving yourself time. It's a specific idea. And what you're saying is, it's not coming from here and from there and from over there. I'm ready to increase my abundance tenfold in the next six months and I will take it from anywhere because I already have inside of me this feeling that I'm honorable and that it's good and it's holy and it's just for me to receive. And so, as you put specific ideas into the universal law, it gives you specific results. Often people will have concepts, goals, and ideas that are so wishy-washy that they can't even explain it to another human individual, let alone explain it to a light, to a God force that reflects exactly back to them where they're at. If you're in confusion, if you have a certain amount of indecision about what your heroic life's goal is or what your mission in life is, then you need to begin to get back inside of yourself and get clear. And sometimes that may take months, but that's okay. You have plenty of time. And as you uncomplicate your life and you move towards simplicity, up from within you naturally comes, hey, I want to be a violinist. Hey, what I really want to do is go and live on a farm in North Africa or whatever it might be. The key to that miracle-making process is balance. Without balance, you really don't have a chance because what you're trying to do is this. You're trying to use the infinity or the light in all things to carry to you the result that you want. And because the light comes out of purity and balance, it can only be congruent with you if you are balanced. And balanced means a balanced physical situation. You don't have to heal everything going on in your body, but at least it has to be balanced and you have to love yourself by caring for your physical body, working on it, being aware when things go wrong, being aware of putting in the correcting action, going off and studying and knowing about your body. And then the second part of balance, of course, is emotional, which we have talked about in the past. And then the mental balance is understanding that for the miracles to happen, you can't engage too much logic. Otherwise, you destroy your belief in the miracles showing up. And between those three items of physical balance, emotional balance, and mental balance, you walk through the physical plane in a measured and powerful way. You don't rush you don't allow yourself to get out of control. You don't give away your power unless you particularly have to or unless you, you make it your decision to do so. And you try to keep as much of your life as immaculate as possible. Then as you begin to create this action plan and you begin to put those miracles up in your mind, you're going to have to remember that there is no time because we live in a state of eternal now. And in that eternal now, you have to create your affirmation or your visualization or your goal in your feelings. If you can feel it granted, if you can feel yourself moving through those circumstances that you desire so much, they will be there. If you think that they're outside of you or that they're attainable at a later date, then you will never pull to you those things that you want. And then as you begin to resonate those feelings and you begin to nurture this little flame of your own intention, then because it is within you and because you believe it, it is granted. But there is a time lag between you conceptualizing the feeling, conceptualizing the goal or the miracle action plan and when it is delivered and in that time you are going to have to be patient no negative yearning no frustration no stomping your foot or whatever you have to wait and the more you wait and you know it will be there that in itself becomes an affirmation where you pull it to you 10 years in the life of a human being is not a long time it seems long because we live it minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. But 10 years is not a long time. And so as you put out those ideas, you wait. Any kind of negativity, any emotion, any negative yearning, and you destroy the plan. As you begin to change yourself into this exhilarating, exciting, fluid, adventure-seeking person, I like the use of affirmations, and affirmations are words that you invent or words that you particularly like that mean something special to you that affirm your individuality, your power, your strength. For example, the first affirmation in the Miracles book that I read out to you was, I am a powerful, positive individual. All events in this day are for my highest good. Let's just look at what you're saying there. You're affirming that the power lies with you and not with somebody else. You're affirming that there's a positivity and goodness and heroicness in that power. 
And then you're looking at the day and you're saying, whatever happens is a part of my greater evolution. I'm not so intimately involved in the motion of what's going on. I understand that all of it is for my highest good. And as you begin to create that kind of affirmation within yourself and you repeat them from time to time, what happens is that the contents of your mind changes. Then what it reflects out into life changes and the quality of your life improves. The last part of this that we need to consider is the concept of creative visualization. Creative visualization really means the ability to use your imagination to stimulate your feelings into believing that a situation is so before it actually materializes in your life. Because, as you've probably heard me say before, the inner mind does not know the difference between fact and fantasy, creative visualization is a powerful tool that you can use for yourself. Some people have difficulty using their imagination. They have difficulty visualizing events or visualizing dream sequences. And that is a habit that you have to form for yourself. Using your imagination, using your ability to fantasize, using your ability to see things in the mind's eye increases your ability to affect events in the world. Because not only can you develop other possibilities, more limitless possibilities perhaps, but also once you can see yourself walking through a scene, you can be a part of it. Through the laws of attraction, what comes to you reflects that inner energy that you hold, what you maintain, the energy that you've created in your life so far. And so imagine this, if you can create a powerful and strong image of yourself as a miracle maker, as this wonderful, wonderful human being that has so much to give, so much to offer the world, then that being comes alive. It is almost as if by putting that energy into the mind, you shine a light in there that stimulates the mind. And so, whereas often people have moved so far away from fantasy and imagination and so solidly into materialism and logic that they don't have an ability to conceptualize things that are not actually logically right there in front of them. They don't have the ability unless they can literally touch it and taste it and see it. If you can begin to practice this idea of creating your imagination the way that you want to see yourself, then you have within you a wonderful tool that will allow you to become a more powerful being. You can use creative visualization for self-acceptance, and that in itself is a very large project, is it not, for some people. Do you accept yourself the way you are? Do you accept, for example, the shape of your face? Your face is whatever shape you've created it, whatever shape it came out as, so to speak. And you have to see that shape as beautiful. You have to be able to stand in the mirror in the bathroom naked and say with all sincerity, this is utter beauty. And once you can see that beautiful, it becomes more beautiful. Once it becomes more beautiful, to say this is utter beauty becomes simpler. And so, first of all, you can look at the whole concept of self-acceptance. If you will give yourself time to go beyond your limitations, if you will forgive yourself for your transcendences or for those parts of yourself that are less than powerful or less than honorable, then you begin to heal your entire personality. There's nothing worse than meeting a person that has a tremendously fragmented personality full of guilt trips, full of negativity, full of lack of self-image. What's nice about you is that you have this positive image of yourself. And as you reflect a positive image of your own worth, then other people reflect that back to you. Isn't it true that if a person has that victim energy inside of themselves, if they feel that they're a victim, life seems to fall in on top of them and create victim. And when you meet one of those people, it's almost as if you want to go punch them in the mouth just to keep them happy. And they pull that to them. When you can see this image of yourself in this loving forgiveness, this unconditional love that you have for yourself, then it becomes simple to transfer that to others. When a person is uncomfortable or frustrated or angry, what they're really saying is, I'm angry with myself. When they judge or criticize or moan, they're judging and criticizing themselves. Because when you're centered and balanced and happy, you will see only happiness and beauty around you. And if somebody does something that you don't like and you are balanced, it won't affect you.
It's only when you are not in balance and you don't have a strong idea of self-image and self-acceptance that you criticize others and that you express this negativity to the world and those people that you are negative to will react negatively back to you. And so the creative visualization process is to see yourself as this complete individual. You haven't completed your journey. You're not perfect. And that's perfect that you're not perfect. You can begin to put all that new energy in. And you can begin to look at your life. You avoid those areas that cause you emotional problems. I don't mean avoid in the sense of dodging them. But what I mean is you are careful not to be sucked into situations you know that you don't deal with well. You engineer your life to enhance the strengths. What I call raise statues to your strengths. And then eventually all the weaknesses fall away. The next idea that I'd like to discuss in relation to creative visualization is for you to begin to visualize what is your higher purpose in life. To have a life that's just mundane, working and surviving and procreating and bringing up the kids and doing the washing up or whatever it is, is not a life of excitement. It doesn't have a higher purpose. And for you to visualize that higher purpose inside your feelings, it begins to give you something to go for. It gives you a higher ideal, a dedication to the force, a dedication to the things that are truly wonderful in life. And so that would be your next step. Once you have a powerful image that you can carry out to the world, that can be some use to the world, then you're looking at developing a dedication, a higher purpose. And if you don't have a higher purpose in your feelings right now, then use creative visualization to see yourself walking in or walking through life with some kind of higher purpose, whatever that purpose may be. There are many possibilities open to you. Perhaps a great diplomat, a peacemaker, perhaps a person of great creativity, perhaps a person who brings to life this incredible ability to nurture and to care for people. Perhaps you're an organizer and that's your gift to the world that you can organize it. Perhaps you're a leader and you can lead it. Perhaps you're a supporter. And you can attach yourself to a leader and know and understand that the supportive role is as important as the leader's role. Perhaps you're a healer that you can bring a healing to yourself and to the people around you. But each and all of us has something that we can contribute. Your gift to the world is what you are. And of course, if you're happy with what you are, your gift is a happy gift. Next, you may want to consider using creative visualization for goal setting. And the whole trick to goal setting is to not set goals that are impossible for you. Because if you can't conceptualize it in your feelings or visualize it in your feelings, then that goal will never be reached. And so I like goal setting, which is only a little way in front of where you are now. And so everything is manageable and everything is possible. And it isn't something where you're asking for the absolute impossible. Because there are things that are impossible to you right now, given the total quantum of energy that is you. However, as you begin to grow from one goal to the next and you begin to expand your experience and your abilities in the physical plane, then other areas and other goals and other possibilities become real to you. The other thing about goals is, of course, that you have to have the ability to let them go, to release them. You're going to go for the goal. If it changes, change it. You don't have to be dogmatic. Isn't it true that when you see people that set out on some kind of quest in a very dogmatic way and they live 20 years in the desert looking for some type of little beetle or something, you often wonder, why do they bother? Why didn't they see that after one or two years in the desert, looking for this beetle was a totally worthless way of spending their life? But what happens is we give the mind a task and it's almost like it fixes itself upon that task. And I think it's important for you to be fluid and to change the goals whenever you need to. You can use creative visualization to see yourself through projects. If you have a project that you have to deliver at a certain time in a certain place, or you have a creative idea, more than likely you're going to pull to you other people that will help you make that project work. And as you begin to pull other people to you, you have to understand that they will have all their own beliefs and their understandings of what the project is. And somehow you have to transfer to them what it is you want, how the project will be handled, how the thing will materialize. As you do that, you have to have a strong image of what is the project.
and creative visualization allows you to run through in your mind it's a bit like a dress rehearsal where you run through the project and you see it coming to its final glorious conclusion as you run through the project in a creative visualization process you can not only look at any kinks and bumps and things that perhaps you may need to change in order for the project to be successful, but also you begin to infuse the project with light and positivity. It's almost as if the project is an idea in the mind of man. You are pulling to you other people. You have to create the project in their mind, and all of you have to infuse the project in light. When you look at the physical plane, it is all materialization of thought form. If you look at a famous bridge, that's a solid bridge, but it was originally a thought form. And the thought form had to have light, it had to have positivity, it had to have the ability to complete the project, it had to have follow-through, financing, and maybe a thousand people worked on putting that bridge together. But somebody somewhere was guiding that thing and granting everybody an idea of what the thought form is. Hey, this is the thought form, this amount of scaffolding, this amount of steel, this amount of concrete, this is how we'll hold the bridge up, this is how we'll pay for it. And so when you go through creative visualization, you can infuse into your life this light that will allow these projects to take place. It's particularly important, say, in a business situation or in an office where you have to motivate other people and a whole group of you have to get together to materialize an action plan or a sales force or whatever it is that you're doing. As you begin to see all of those people responding positively to you, you can also begin to use creative visualization to see them understanding what the project is. Often, when a project fails, it fails because of a lack of communication. People cannot read your mind. You will think that they automatically know what you feel and who you are and what you want. They don't. And you can say to somebody, please dig a hole here and you presume they know what you mean. But inside the mind of the person listening to the instruction, they don't necessarily know. And what they think is a hole here may be a totally different concept of what you think dig a hole here means. And so they dig a little round hole that's a foot deep, and what you really wanted was an oblong trench 30 yards wide. And so if you understand that, using creative visualization and becoming organized in your feelings, you get a very clear concept of what you want. Then you can say to that person, I need a hole here. It needs to be 30 yards long, 3 yards wide, and it's going to go from the lamppost to the tree. And everybody understands what you want. And usually you're going to have to find that you're going to have to tell people three times before they really understand something. So later in the conversation you will say, by the way, do you know how long this hole is? They say, yep, 30 yards. Okay, where's it got to be built? And they'll say, well, it's got to go from the tree to the bus stop. You say, nope, it's got to go from the tree to the lamppost. And they say, fine, I've got it. Then you go back and you say, how wide's the hole? And they say, well, you want it as wide as a spade. And you say, nope, I don't want it as wide as a spade. I want it three feet wide. And you begin to explain to people what you want. And you can only do that if it's a conceptual idea in your feelings. And that conceptualization in your feelings has clarity. And so as you begin to use this process, you can see that what you're really doing is, is you're becoming organized and you're clearing yourself out as an individual. Finally, I think that creative visualization can be used most effectively in creating for yourself a sanctuary. As I said earlier on, you are an individual and you are on your own. The only way you can get in touch with who am I and work upon yourself is for you to pull out of the hustle and bustle of daily life and to look at yourself. And that sanctuary is a place where you are in prayer with yourself. And that prayer can be in any way that you want to pray, or it can be a meditation, or it can be listening to music, or it can be running on the beach. But you do have to have time where you begin to look at your feelings, where you begin to process all of the negativity out, where you make the negativity little by making it unimportant. And you make the good things, the glorious things, the loving things important. And that, I think, is one of the main functions of creative visualization. As you develop this technique, the miracle maker's technique, one of the things that perhaps you're going to want to work on is your ability to pull prosperity. 
And of course, the very first thing that you have to do is you have to go beyond the tribal beliefs of scarcity. The world is not scarce. It is superfluous in its abundance. There is more of everything that we'll ever need than we can possibly use. We believe in scarcity because we're taught it. Using the creative visualization technique and using the miracle action plan, you can begin to see yourself more prosperous. And that is going to be vital for you because you're going to need money. And with that money, you're going to buy those experiences and those understandings and that knowledge that you need to acquire. And so as you begin to see yourself more prosperous, you become more prosperous. It's as simple as that. What makes a very wealthy businessman wealthy is the fact that he's comfortable or she is comfortable with money. She's comfortable and he is comfortable with receiving. And he sees himself in the marketplace creating many things. And those many things bring that kind of abundance. What you're doing then with your visualization plan or with your miracle plan is you're writing a film script and you're creating a film where you're living comfortably in luxury it, with all the things that you need around you and all of that money energy is there. You're organized. You've got a way of taking the money. You know how to account for it. You can bank it. You can add it up. You have it in balance. You're conscious so that you know how much money you have. You don't find yourself spending 5000 and earning four. You find that you are in control. And in the same way as you have to train yourself to know who you are, in the same area, in money, you have to train yourself to know about what resources you have, what they bring in, and how much your lifestyle costs. If you've got yourself out of control and your lifestyle costs more than you're actually earning, you have one of two options. One, reduce your lifestyle. Cut out those things that are not necessary, that are not absolutely needed for your life. And the other thing is to go out into the marketplace and create more money. There's a simplicity in that that most people miss. But it is simple. And it is simple to be in charge of money and to be powerful and to have the money that you want in your life. But first, it has to be a concept inside of you a creative visualization and feeling that you will always be looked after, that there will always be enough money. As you develop desires, as you develop goals, you have to understand that your goal has to be like a purpose in life rather than an addiction. As you develop a goal to become a great musician, that would be a purpose, and the purpose of being a great musician would be, one, you're expressing creativity, two, you're doing something you enjoy, and three, you're giving that joy to others. If that purpose becomes an addiction, it becomes obsessive, then you begin to destroy the quality of the desire. The whole reason why desires come about is that it's almost as if you can ignore them. Once you have the desire, you can put it out there, you can do all the things that you're going to need to do to materialize the desire, but also a part of you has to release the desire. And if you say, well, if I don't become a great musician, what I'll do is I'll just get joy from playing whatever music it is I play. I'll get joy from listening to other people's music. I'll get joy of creating this dimension of sound around me that gives me pleasure. And so you have to be careful with that because so often desires become obsessions. And that, in a way, has a way of destroying your ability to materialize that desire. It all really goes back, does it not, into you believing in yourself. And of course, you can't say to a person, hey, believe in yourself, if they don't. What you have to do is you have to begin to see your life as an affirmation of your belief in yourself. And as you begin to see where the successes are, what works and what doesn't, then slowly but surely, you come into an energy where believing in yourself is natural. You naturally know that you can follow through, that you can deliver. Finally, I'd like to say this. The planet Earth will be healed. There will be prosperity for all people. There will be an end to wars. There will be a golden age. However, as humans, we have to understand that it may take time. It may take a long time. But we can be sure that it will be there because it is so much part of the inner yearning of humanity. When you pull out of the day-to-day -day life and you become prosperous, you become peaceful, your body is healed, you have already created the golden age within you.
And so if we are walking on a planet and there's 4.9 billion people, if you are one that has the golden age there already, you begin to create that for everybody else. Your gift to the world will be this power that you create. And you will create it silently. You won't wear it on your sleeve, sort of pushing it upon people or bragging about it. You just create power. And you create this golden age around you. And people will see it inside of you. And they'll say, gosh, isn't that person marvelous? I mean, aren't they wonderful? Look how calm and peaceful they are, how poised they are. Look at their sensuality, their beauty. Look at their understanding, their knowledge, their wisdom. And you become that energy. Nobody is going to come down to the planet Earth and wave a wand and fix it for us. We're going to fix it as individuals. You fix it for yourself, and then you radiate that magnificence to others. That is your gift to the world, and that is your higher purpose in life. Thank you. There now follows a Creating Miracles in Your Life meditation. Before we begin, take one or two items from your Miracle Action Plan list, those things that you wish to materialize in your life, and review them in your mind. Find a place that you won't be disturbed in. Find a comfortable chair and sit down. Have your back straight, your feet upon the floor, your hands on your lap, palms down. Take a slow and gentle breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale. Take another slow and gentle breath. Hold that for a moment. Then exhale. Take another slow and gentle breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale. Feel your body becoming deeply relaxed. Feel how simple it is to relax your entire body. In your mind's eye, I would like you to imagine yourself walking across a green field. Be aware of the freshness of the grass at your feet. Be aware of the warmth of the sun. Be aware of an expanse of water somewhere near the field. Be aware of birds flying back and forth, melodically singing their tunes. And as you walk through this field, I want you to become aware of a sense of deep inner calm, a sense that you and nature are one and the same, that you have within you the same abundance that is in nature. And as you walk along this field, I want you to be aware of a small hill in the distance. Walk up towards the hill. And as you get to the top of the hill, I want you to find a comfortable place to sit down. Sit with your back straight and your feet upon the floor. Your hands in your lap, palms down. Take a moment to put your mind into your left foot and totally relax your left foot. Next, put your mind into your right foot and relax your right foot. Then transfer your mind into your legs and totally relax the muscles of your legs. Feel your body becoming more and more relaxed. Relax your upper torso. Release all tension from your chest. Take a slow and gentle breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale, going deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper. Release all tension from your neck and your shoulders. Relax the muscles of your arms. 
Feel your hands heavy in your lap. Release all tension from your neck and shoulders, the muscles of your jaw, and the muscles around your eyes. Take a slow and gentle breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale. As you sit there in nature, I want you to be aware of a small forest that's nearby. Get up from where you're sitting and walk calmly and gracefully toward that forest. Begin to walk into the forest. Begin to feel the life force of the forest all around you. Feel yourself entering deeper and deeper into the forest. You become aware of the fact that it's getting darker and darker. The vegetation all around you is getting thicker. Your progress is slowing somewhat. As you move through this forest, feel a deep sense of inner security, even though you do not know where you're going. Continue to walk down this path through the forest, and as you do so, be aware of the vegetation that is thickening around you. Be aware that somehow, some way, your progress is slowing almost to a standstill. And as you look at your body, be aware of the fact that the vegetation is growing around your limbs and around your legs. Allow the vegetation to hold you and to wrap you. Be aware of vines and bushes that are growing around your arms, holding you in position. Allow that to happen. Allow that to be. And as you look at these vines and you look at the vegetation that's holding you in place, become aware that that vegetation is in fact your limitations. Programming that is a part of your mind. Be aware of how much that limitation has served you in the past. Be aware of how those limitations have allowed you to reach this point in your life. Become aware of the fact that you now wish to release those limitations. Beside you, there in the forest. Is a stick. I want you to move your body just a little bit so that you can pick up the stick. Once you have the stick in your hand, I want you to begin to thrash and to cut and to break away that vegetation and those vines that are holding you in place. Do that now. We'll wait for you. As you release the limitations around you, realize how free you are becoming, without all those encumbrances, without all those old belief patterns holding you back. And as you free yourself from the vines and the vegetation that was holding you, I want you to continue along your path down through the forest. You're perfectly at one and at peace with all things. High above you. Is a ray of sunlight shining down upon your path, bathing you in a golden light. And as you walk down this path, I want you to be aware of a large rock covered in moss. Go up to the rock and find a comfortable place to sit down. Be aware of the golden light shining upon the center of your being. Take a slow and gentle breath, and as you exhale, say silently, "My expectations are truly limitless." 
put up in your mind's eye the first item on your miracle action plan. Take a good look at that thing that you truly want in your life. As you look at it, become familiar with it and become familiar with the way it feels. See yourself with that thing granted in your life. Do that now. When you're truly familiar with what that thing feels like, I want you to put it on like an overcoat and have it permeate every molecule of your being. Make it a part of your life. Feel it granted. Know that it is there. Next, put up another item from your miracle list and take a good look at that. Turn it around. Feel yourself a part of it. Feel those circumstances unfolding in your life. Be sure that you and the thing that you desire are one and the same, congruent in every way. Take a moment to look at the second item on your miracle list. Once you're sure that you really know what that is, and once you can feel yourself a part of it, and it is a part of you, put it on like an overcoat. Have it permeate every molecule of your being. Take a slow and gentle breath. Hold it for a moment. Exhale, going deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper. Finally, put up the third item from your miracle action plan and take a look at that. Remember to be sure that you know how it feels. Remember to make it a natural part of your life. Once you and that item are one and the same energy, put it on like an overcoat and have it permeate every molecule of your being. Be aware of the ray of golden light shining upon the center of your body and allow that body to diffuse through your entire being. Take a slow and gentle breath and say silently after me, I'm eternal immortal, universal and infinite. My expectations are truly limitless. Move away from the rock and continue walking down the path. As you walk down the path, going ever deeper and deeper into the forest, become aware of a nature spirit or some type of nature being sitting on a tree stump up ahead of you. Take a moment to honor the spirit of the nature being and then walk up towards it. Realize that the nature being is truly powerful, truly all-known. The nature being tells you that you may ask it one question about your life and it will answer. Ask your question now. We will wait for you. Once the nature spirit gives you the answer to your question, turn around and begin to walk out of the forest once more. As you walk down the path, be aware of the rock once more. 
be aware of the ray of sunlight shining upon your being. And as you come through the area where the vines and the leaves originally held you, be aware that some of them have now grown back. Take the stick and cut away the last vines, the last limitations. And when you feel totally clear of any restriction or limitation in your life, walk gradually and peacefully out of the forest. Walk down the little hill and across the field and then turn and face the sunlight. Allow it to shine upon the scent of your being. Take a slow and gentle breath and repeat after me. Change is a natural part of my life. All things are possible to me. I am what I am. And what I am has beauty and strength. And in your own time and space, open your eyes and return to the physical plane.